I know how those press junkets are. You're like, uh, who's this? What fucking interview is this? Here comes those same questions. You know, it's like a, it's, it's a evil, right? I think this one's going to be different. <laughs> <laughs> That's so fucking funny. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't Do think I don't think you've been interviewed by a comedian today. That's for sure. I have not. So if that's what's going to happen, I'm game. Are you a comedy guy? If you're funny, I will welcome it. No, but I mean, do, do you do you watch comedy? Yeah, you know, I have one one thing in life I do and. Basically, that's it. I, I listen. I play music. I listen to music. You know, I'm not. I'm not a big comedy guy. No, no. But yeah. you could. You could educate me. I'm. I'm open. Well, I mean, I understand that. Like, I played music for years, and you're just. That's what you do. And then uh, there's also that paranoia of like, if you did anything else, you might go like, "Oh man, I I want to try this over here." You know. <laughs> Maybe right. You don't know. Yeah, you so. don't know. Where are you at? I am at I'm in New York. Yeah. I live just out, outside of New York City, a little northwest of the city. Yeah, man. I, I love the city. I lived there for a few years, uh, Gramercy, uh, right before COVID. It was great. Yeah, it's fun. A lot of energy going on there, right? Oh God, yeah. You know? Uh New York oh, and so LA, you know, those are the <clears throat> those are the uh spots to me. Anyway, welcome to the okay. show, buddy. Um, Thank you. Thank great you. to have you. I had Mike on, I think about a year ago. And, uh, you know, it's it's always funny to think about the dream theater world because there's so many people that don't really know who dream theater is and listen, but then the core fans are the dream fans you <clears> want. <throat> people that are just around hardcore forever. No fair weather fans. Exactly. You know, you meet people that you say dream theater, they look at you with this blank stare and you meet somebody else and you say it and they go, oh, my God, you know, they're like freaking out, and starting to shake. So it's that definitely that kind of thing. Yeah. And it, and it could be uh, said about a lot of the kind of prog of like, you know, yes, of course, yes, had some songs on the radio and and rush and all that. But there is always that core uh following of that type of music prog prog rock prog metal you know exactly it's a special kind of music and there's uh, a select audience out there in the case of dream theater you know it's quite a big audience but it's at the same time it's not a commercial thing you know where it's not it's definitely different well that kind of thing gives you hope in uh, in the world if you're doing art that's outside the box and you're able to support yourself even at a fantastic level of like dream theater it gives you hope of like oh yeah not everybody's just looking for vanilla you know and and those are the type of audiences i like to uh talk to and in, and perform for yeah, I think that you're absolutely right. I mean, let's face it, if you're if you're providing something that is really commercial, the chances are it's going to be something that appeals to the average intelligence. If you're doing something that has more depth to it, well then it's naturally going to have a smaller crowd, but you know, in the case of like progressive rock and progressive metal and you know, styles like that, you're appealing to a a, a certain kind of intellect. Right. And also, you know, especially like in the in well, in the music space, in today's world, people's attention spans, as we know, has gotten less and less because we're the TikTok uh, in Instagram uh, generation and we're, you know, scrolling through like this. And, you know, you, you, I, like I'll put something up online and, you know, I'll think, oh, man, that's a cool piano piece. I really got into it and I played it really well. And I'll look at the insights what do, what what do people do with it? They listen to it for like ten seconds. That's the most people will just say ten seconds, and then they're gone. Could be the greatest thing I ever played, but they're gone after ten seconds, and that, you know, that sucks. However, you know, like I'm still making albums. Dream Theater is still making full albums because we are planning, hoping that people put it on and want to go for the ride, want to take the journey. 
And that to me is still something that's really valid. You know, a lot of, a lot of us artists out there are still holding on because we feel like, Hey, we're not going to let go of our art form and the idea of giving people something that they can really invest in. I think it's really important. It really is, man. If you think about some of the masterpiece films, even uh, say Apocalypse Now, where if they turn that in now, if Coppola turned it in, people in the studios would be like, oh, oh no, this is three and a half hours. We need 90 minutes. Just, uh, you know, skip this whole boat scene, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be fucking absurd yeah everything has to be really cut down now so thankfully as you know you and i know there's still people out there that are uh that are you know wanting this that are craving the, you know this higher form of of uh, entertainment and art and uh and there's still people like myself and my band and others that want to deliver it yeah uh, and and thank God, you know, that there are people and and also people like Dream Theater that are able to do it. And a lot of it has to do with the incredible fans. A lot like I uh, just went and saw Dead and Co. last week. The fans are totally different type of people. They're not looking for the AM radio. They're not necessarily the uh, TikTokers or whatever. They enjoy and experience a ride. You go to a Dream Theater concert or uh you know dead and co you're you're seeing something that's almost uh, a relic from the past but young people are embracing it like oh god this is great you know totally yeah it's really interesting to see the the audiences i'm sure that was a pretty cool show though you went to the other Ooh, day man yeah it's all good yeah that's awesome yeah. um yeah. I grew up in the 70s. It's interesting that you are 68, by the way. I am 58, and you look fantastic. And uh, oh, hats wait a minute, I'm, I'm 67, by the way. 67. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Big hey, difference there, right? Don't don't want to fuck yeah. up, man. Should we start the interview <laughs> over? I could hear the Dream yeah, Theater man. fans right now. They got this guy doesn't know shit. He he yeah. said he was 68. Dream Theater fans are nutty. They know everything about the band, and I'm not sitting here saying I'm a Dream that's, Theater uh, expert, but well, I always am trying to learn, and that's why I have people on the podcast. But 67, man, are you? Uh, I quit sugar seven years ago. What, uh, what do you, do you eat clean? Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I had to think about it for a minute when you put out the 68 thing. I mean, yeah, I'm still trying to get used to 67, although 68 is right around the corner. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, do I eat clean? Yeah, I try, I try to, you know, I, I definitely am. I'm a person in moderation. Let's put it that way. I'm not, you know, I'm not doing anything to an extreme to like, like many people we know. And I think that that has always really kept me in, you know, really good shape. I'm kind of a, in some ways, a careful person. So I'm not doing crazy shit. And, you know, I, I really think that that has a lot to do with the, you know, the way that I appear. And, you know, as we know, age is a total, it's a number. It's nothing to do with, you know, anything really because you've got people who are like 80 years old like um mick jagger who who's dancing like you know like he's you know 25 or something i mean who the hell knows what kind of <clears throat> expensive vitamins he's taking but you know there's all it's just it's funny like that but yeah. i also attribute it to my you know my wife and the fine care that she takes of me and my music and all the doing things that i really love and uh, yeah, man, that's that's just what it is. That time around the 70s, there was some of the best keyboard players going. And it, it's funny to think about like somebody like, you know, John Lord uh, or, you know, I, I'm on the spectrum of all different keyboard players than Greg Allman and the Allman Brothers and, and that. But then here comes Kraftwerk uh, for me around 1978. And it completely changes my whole life and turns me upside down of anything I even know about music and becomes still to this day, one of my favorite groups and Devo with their synth sounds and, and all of that. I, and I know that you were into yes and John Lord and stuff. 
but what chose you not to go more of that kind of techno side like gary newman was big at the time and everything uh, and i know you had that band complex but where were you on that were you just trying to play with anybody at the time um well my biggest influences in the in the you know keyboard world were people like keith emerson right rick wakeman patrick Moraz. You know, those guys, and certainly John Lord was amazing and influential. Um, those are the biggest influences. But aside from the like prog rock influences, I was also really influenced by artists like Tomita, oh, yeah. uh, who was incredible, like, like Walter, now Wendy Carlos, doing Switched on Bach. Uh, and in a very big way, groups like Tangerine Dream. Like they had an album, I don't know if you ever heard of them, but they had an album called Phaedra that was incredibly uh influential and inspirational to me the way they use synthesizers um you know more kind of like leaning towards almost a classical use of electronic instruments there was morton there is morton sabotnik who is doing incredible sounds his albums like touch or sidewinder really really big influence to me uh and you know when i discovered the synthesizer there was a whole period of time when I wasn't really necessarily playing it like Wakeman style where he would create it, get get a good patch and kind of fix the knobs there and play a nice, you know, lead or whatever. I, I had one hand on the keyboard and one hand always on the knobs. And I used to go with some friends and we used to do like late night college radio stations and just trip people out like at midnight and just play like the most wild, crazy shit that you've ever heard in your life. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm, you know, my musical world is basically coming from classical piano. And then around 17 or 18, I discovered progressive rock and Genesis and Yes and ELP and King Crimson and Gentle Giant. Mix that with all the electronic and the really spacey stuff. And you kind of start to understand where I'm coming from. Yeah, man, that it, there's a somebody just turned me on to this uh, this group a couple weeks ago, and that's what I love about music. You're constantly uh, like you, I'm sure. I'm thirsty for new music all the time. But floating points, have you heard these guys? I don't think so. No, what's that about? It's like really kind of mellow space rock, almost like uh, meditation. A little bit and it but okay. really incredible and um they had a record out in 2021 that just really blows my mind so check that out so it's oh. interesting where people floating take point. okay yeah floating point um and the record is called hold on i just want to give it to you because um sure. all right it's down. Float floating points uh uh, the and the London Symphony Orchestra. It's a record they oh. did together in uh, March 26, 21. Okay. And the songs, there's only four, and they're like, you know, 18 minutes each, and they just take you for a fucking ride, man. That's cool. Have you ever heard have you ever heard carbon-based life forms? No. They'll be your next ride. Another, uh, I'll check that out right now. Uh, yeah, I mean, carbon, not, carbon based life forms. Go listen to some of their shit. You'll like is, it. Is that a uh, synth kind of prog or space? Elec electro ele it's electronic, floaty, spacey, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely cool stuff. You'll like it. it it's funny to think about. Uh, we talk about that. You, you know, you could you can listen to people and they'd be like, Oh, I, I don't listen to any of that stuff, but I really kind of contribute, of course, my love of craft work and then Devo, but then the Metallica and justice for all album comes out, which uh, I consider the greatest prog metal record for me. That's for me. That really kicks it off to the Queens Reich into the dream theater kind of time change, you know, timeline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know what you mean. Those are those are major influences like that. That whole Metallica sound was the was a primary influence to the Dream Theater guys. Especially that record and Justice for All. Right. You know, because that yeah. thing is I mean, like... not honestly, not 
Yeah, yeah. No, I know it's cool. Not necessarily. My Metallica education came when I joined Dream Theater, and I was thinking, well, what what makes the sound? What you know helped to create the sound? Because I only joined about twenty six years ago, and they had already been going. So I was interested to know what influences helped to shape their sound. And it what really helped me to understand that is when we started to do the cover albums, and we did an Iron Maiden album, and we did the Metallic album. And I was like, okay, I'm I'm getting this now. I see I see where this all uh, comes from. You know, it's a big part of it. Yeah, because the, I think the big big part of what Prague is is like your new single is eight minutes forty five seconds. Is a big part of it is time changes and length and 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 journeys in the song. It's not like verse, chorus, verse, bridge, solo. You know, chorus out. Right, right, exactly. I mean, that's, uh, you know, that's kind of like tipping the hat to like classical music in the sense where it's not so formulaic and, you know, it's just able to develop ideas and you have a motif and you play with it and you turn it around and you modulate it and maybe we take something that was happening in the melody and we put it in the, you know, in the bass part and make up different chords. It's more like a you know, Prague has a lot to do with looking at like musical compositional techniques and taking and using them and taking more advanced kind of harmonic ideas uh, from, a you know, from like classical music, you know, where where typical rock might have three or four chords. Progressive rock doesn't doesn't do that, really. We're We're looking deeper. We're kind of going in there and saying, well, there's a lot of a lot of chords. And we can keep that rock energy and maybe even some, in my case, some like electronic music, you know, uh, timbres. But that's I think that's what, what it's all about. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny to think like from classical, uh, I mean, even Miles Davis, his whole thing, like if you listen to On the Corner, you're definitely going, oh, well, he was obviously a classical and jazz, you know, mixing that into it. And that's almost like early prog, you know? Yeah, right, right, definitely. All that kind of stuff when you're thinking outside the box, right? Yeah. You're playing around with different, mixing different styles together and creating your own soup. I mean, that's very much like that idea of like having styles enter my brain, right? And then almost without thinking about it being stirred up here and just kind of just coming out that's what that's who i am as a musician i never i never was like okay i'm a jazz musician or i'm a rock guy or i'm a this i'm a that got a lot of things floating around my head and they come out as they do from this mixture of all the different influences an interesting thing that i don't think it's enough of um credit in the 70s you know you got yes and and genesis and and you have craft work and 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 all of this but yeah. on the other side of the coin you have he funk you know who is definitely engaged in massive keyboards and it's like frog funk <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah right right that's true this is something you know if somebody wants to dive in to the music world like you have, like I have in my own way, there's always something to discover, right? There's always some other genre which might've touched on your genre, which it's just, it's a, you know, it can be a fascinating awakening to, to open up to that. There's a, there's a strange uh, kind of uh, era in music. So, you know, this late sixties, all the bands had keyboard players and uh, probably the biggest one would be the doors with Ray Manzarek and, and the Farfisa and the, Amer you know, Clavinet and all those classic analog keys that I love uh, uh, the roads. And then you get into the kind of proggy and the big B3 and, and synths and everything. And then in the eighties, it's kind of like eh, no more keys in rock. You know, it's like, Keys, no way. That's not rock. Other than like Bon Jovi, who had keys, everybody ditched the keys. Wasn't that an interesting time? That was upsetting for keyboardists. Of course, <laughs> but it's it's so real because 
to me, not until the Black Crows hire Ed Harsh on B3 does it kind of come back. And they're more of like a Southern rock. Uh, you know, the Stones had Chuck Lavelle and these guys playing keys or, yeah. or Billy Preston. But it wasn't really until this, the Black Crows that keys start to come back into music again. Have you ever heard Speedway Boulevard? No, no. That was my first uh, like rock group experience in the early 80s. It was on Epic Records. I joined a band. Uh, we put out an album by its own name. Actually, it came out on Epic. And then it was a whole thing. And it, it, it's a long story. Where, um, <clears throat> but anyway, you can find it. Just check it out. It has some keyboards on it. It was rocking. Uh, and uh, yeah, part of my history. What was the flavor? Was it kind of Southern rock or, or we, we had a, we had a black singer who was very, a great singer, a lot of feel rest of the band were a bunch of rock kind of like white dudes. And I came in with my influences. Um, it was, it was a rock, it was a rock album, but it had little touches of like prog in it. You definitely got to check it out. Speedway Boulevard. Yeah. Look it up. You search I, my I, name and uh, yeah, to find it. I do remember being at the uh, concrete convention, you know, in Burbank back then. And, no and shit. yeah, because I, I went to all of those, you know, and it was always amazing because they would have those showcases in that little weird, funky ballroom in the hotel. And you would go right. watch the bands play, you know, and that was like your first gig. That was my one-off gig with dream theater yeah for, before i did not take the job that they offered me uh, for dixie different, dregs. different reasons and then i went off and did some touring with the dixie dregs and that was like you know 30 years ago and i just did a dixie dregs tour i don't know if you know but i just played a couple of rounds of touring with them recently 30 years later were at any time were you like a b3 guy I tell the story of when I did an album with uh, David Bowie wow. and uh, I had all my synthesizers set up and I was all proud and ready to go. Each synthesizer had these rack units. Oh, one yeah. was all the vintage sounds. One was like orchestral sounds. Another one was all the cool like effects. And Tony Visconti, who was producing the album, came up to me and said, OK, you know, it's the first day we're ready to do the first track. I was like, yeah, I'm ready to go. I'm going to change this man's life. I got all these cool sounds. And he was like, OK, we're going to start off with a, with a Hammond organ track. I was like, great. I got 30 Hammond sounds on this synthesizer here. He's like, no, 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 no. So we got a Hammond over there in the corner. We're going to dust it off and then you're going to play that. It's like, uh, Tony, I said, you know, I'm a classical pianist turned synthesis. I don't even know how to turn on a Hammond. I don't know anything about Hammond organs. He was like, don't worry, don't worry. We'll get it turned on. Just pull out some draw bars. It'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> pull out some draw bars. <clears throat> you, know, you know what's funny about that is that's totally like a, a producer's mind on a keyboard player. You know, they would never do that to a guitar player. Like, well, I've never played, uh, you know, a uh, nylon string guitar, you know, or whatever. And and then what they're probably really looking for is just one B three swell, the with the fucking with the you know the the whir, the whirly flying the uh you know the uh what do they call the uh, thing the uh, the rotary the speaker the Leslie the Leslie yeah the Leslie cabinet. just yeah. they just want one swell and they're like they're, we got it they want the sound yeah anyway it worked out I, I pulled out the draw bars I played the key the right notes and everybody was pretty happy I think. <laughs> are you uh blown away by because i was watching your new video the alchemist which by the way is fantastic your playing oh, is you. is is disturbing how uh incredible it is <laughs> and um uh, are, are you pretty blown away because i played music for years and we had a keyboard player and and i am a huge fan of the b3 and then of course we start getting into, well, we're in a van. We can't get that fucking B3. So we start getting the simulators, the Nord and the, you know, the Hammond, uh, I think it's the C or whatever, the C2 or whatever they had the, their simulator. Yes. And then there's, yes. uh, 
simulating um, Leslie speakers and stuff. And I noticed that um, you play Korg. Are you blown away by how far we've come with the, uh, you know, the the patched in sounds? Yeah, it's ama- it really is amazing how these powerful synthesizers can, you know, really reproduce these sounds. I will tell you that in the latest Dream Theater album, though, we had a real Leslie in there. And I used a Hammond, not a, not a big B3, but I used, I think it's called an X5 a slab Hammond that they make. So I went more for the, the real deal. But it, it's, the, it's the Leslie that seems to make a lot of di- real difference when it comes down to it. Just the kind of crunchiness you get out of it. I mean, I can... I can create, here's what it comes down to for me. Aside from that, this feeling of the air moving, which is hard to reproduce with a synth, you can pretty much get the sound, right? But the problem is that on an organ, if you play in this, like a certain register, like a mid register, like I could achieve that on a synthesizer, but when I start moving up the keys, it's almost like, it doesn't translate. So when I'm when I'm making patches for like a dream theater gig, and I'm not using a, uh, the Leslie and the Hammond uh, instrument that I'm using, I almost have to switch patches depending on where I'm playing it to get the sound. So there's something different about the way the Hammond speaks throughout the range of the instrument. It's interesting that you did talk about like you know uh, guitar players are using fractals now and. And they simulated uh, Leslie's and stuff. It, it's weird to sit on stage. Sometimes I go to a gig. My friends are in the band, so I'm sitting on stage. And 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 there's no amps or whatever. That's cool, a clean look or whatever. But when you play music for so long with the amps and everything up there, it's weird for no air movement. There's it, It's really like digital, like da 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 But there's nothing. It's bizarre to me. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I like digital technology and I think that there's definitely so much you can do with it. I mean, some of the new neural DSP stuff, fractal stuff is incredible, of course. you know, um, but there's a time and a place for every, everything like in the studio again with dream theater, we decided that, Hey, let's get a real Leslie in here and just push the air and record it that way. And it sounds fantastic, you know? Oh God. I mean, don't get me wrong. Uh, the fractal stuff is amazing. Like, you know, uh, incredible. Yeah. I, beautiful. I stuff. opened for Metallica. Uh, uh, I do comedy. So I opened for him on their 40th. So the guy's running me through it and he's just like, okay, right here. Here's the master of puppets exact tone. It's right here. And so when they play master of puppets, you're getting the album tone. It's so bizarre, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And also, you don't have to travel with a bunch of shit because it costs so much to tour now. You're like, all right, we right. can tour way cheaper. We also got a uh, a beautiful Yamaha C7 piano in the studio to, for the Dream Theater album, which was incredible. It sounded great. So we had a real piano and a real Leslie, and you know, it was it was awesome. I read somewhere recently that you were saying that with Mike back in, it definitely has the, uh, the magic, um, that, you know, the, I'm a, a firm believer in chemistry. Of course, dream theater has been super successful still without Mike, but there's always that thing, man, uh, called chemistry and you cannot, you cannot, you know, fabricate that. Absolutely. I mean, I, the, what I, the way I've been describing it is that, you know, Hey, we won a Grammy. We had 13 years. We made great albums. When Mike walked in the room and started to work with us, my first feeling was like, oh, my God, this person, he's such a part of this. His, you know, not only is drumming, which has its own feeling, sound and personality, but all the all the various talents that he brings in to an artistic, in this case, band situation. You know, both in the audio world and the visual world, the way he thinks is different. Uh, his, uh, you know, these days, even his knowledge of social media and the way he handles that, he's just so great at it. Um, his understanding of the relationship with the fans, building set lists. I mean, you know, we survived fine. 
we wrote some, I think some damn good music, you know, for many years. Uh, but hey, it feels so great to have Mike back because he's a man who brings with him a lot. There's a lot of depth to who he is as a person and as a musician and as a creator. And, you know, and we all appreciate it so much. Yeah. And, the, and it just makes full circle on the history of that, you know, it's, yeah. it, there's yeah. nothing it's weirder, cool. weirder than a, a position um, of the drummer or even you when you came in for Derek, where you get these people forever that are never going to be happy. They still go to the gigs and support it, but they're still on the chat boards. They're still talking to people at the gigs. Like, bye, 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 bye. you know? <laughs> But yeah, no, it's fantastic. We're in our next chapter and everybody around the world is just so excited about it. This is so much energy. People are buying tickets, you know, like crazy. And we're going to put on a, you know, we're going to put on a great, great show. There's no, there's no doubt about it. Yeah, absolutely. Now, um, you got the solo record coming out, Permission to Fly. When does that come out? So Permission to Fly is going to be coming out on September 6th. You can pre-order it right now. Go over to Inside Out's website. Um, two songs have been released so far. Embers was released on the Moises platform. For those of you who don't know, Moises is this amazing application that lets you separate tracks. So you upload a, an audio track and it comes back to you from the server a minute or two later. All of a sudden you have like the vocals separate, the keyboards the bass the guitar it's like having access to the individual tracks it's amazing um so we released embers on that platform and had a contest so people could actually do play the guitar or sing or play drums or keyboards whatever they wanted to uh and then mo more recently we released the alchemist wayne joiner um uh, did this amazing video for me um and that came out and uh, there's another video that's going to be coming out. Very excited. Not quite ready to talk about that, but very soon I will. Um, and then the album's going to come out pretty soon. And uh, that'll give people something really, I think, meaty and substantial to listen to while they wait for the Dream Theater album. Any vinyl on this, uh, on your solo record? Yeah, I think they're going to do that. Yeah, it it's coming out on Inside Out, so they'll do the usual treatment and then when is the dream theater album coming out well we don't have a release date yet but it'll be you know sometime after that right right uh yeah. i read i read somewhere that you have perfect pitch and uh i always wanted to talk to somebody about that at what point do you figure out you have perfect pitch and are you able to listen to singers live without going crazy um well uh, yeah, I have perfect pitch, and I realized that when I was young, and it just came up like, oh, that's an E, and somebody said, how do you know that? I was like, doesn't everybody know that? Because to me, it was always like, you know, you look at something, oh, that's black. I mean, there's no question what the color is. To me, if you play a note, there's no question what the pitch is. Um, but as far as like a little flat, a little sharp, yeah, I mean... I, I'm like, you know, most sensitive musicians. If you played something and somebody was flat, you go, ah, you know, but it's not like, I guess some people out there can say, oh, that's an E, but it's three cents flat. I don't, I don't have that. You know, right. uh, if, if you put a note in the air and it's an E, there's a range to me of E, like it's an E. I'm not going to really be able to tell you exactly how sharp or flat, but I know that general color, if you will, like that's blue. Is yeah. it very blue? Is it a little blue? Ah, whatever. It's blue. So, so if somebody, let's just give uh, the audience a little idea of what we're talking about. If somebody just gets a guitar out and they just play a note and you're not looking, you can just say C sharp yeah. or, or E. Yeah. Can... Oh, definitely. Yeah. So Absolutely. That, <laughs> that must have been lightning speed for you to learn covers. Um, yeah, no, it, it definitely changes your perspective and it changes the way you absorb music and the way you write it. It's a definite thing. I've been learning how to play the guitar the last few years. I've been on a very serious guitar kick. It's a very a big hobby for me, really. But um, And it's interesting because on the guitar, perfect pitch is 
is not necessarily the best thing. Relative pitch would be better. This is a whole bunch of dots and spaces and like you just need to know what the what the relation is, the relative relation is. And I'm sitting there trying to say, okay, on that dot, on that space, on that string is an A. But when you look at the guitar, it's like there's a lot of dots and there's a lot of spaces. So it gets a little complicated. So it's almost like you need to change your perspective, which is really one of the reasons why I'm doing it, because I'm interested to, you know, always grow and develop my my uh, my brain. Well, also the the strange thing of guitar <clears throat> is if I go up and I'm going to play an E and I press down on the string, I'm at the E position, but I could press it a little harder or push it a little bit, even though I'm in the E position, it's no longer E. Yeah, it'll change pitch, right? It's tricky. It's definitely tricky, not like a piano. Yeah. Now, when you're out with Dream Theater, how many keyboards you got? Um, <clears throat> I got, uh, well, I mostly use my Kronos keyboard. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the kind of keyboardist who instead of having like a lot of keyboards, I like to get one mothership, really super powerful one that I program the shit out of. And I put it on my rotating stand so I can turn this way and I can turn that way and, you know, really do a, have some fun and put on a show. Um, so a little bit of a different approach for uh, a prog rock keyboardist, but I have a different, you know, way about things for sure. Yeah. It was great to talk to you and uh, congrats on the solo record. Congrats on dream theater with Mike back in. I know it's going to be a, uh, an insane massive tour this year and, uh, and the fans are fired up and it was great to uh, meet you, man. And um, you um, know, it's just a smoker on the keyboards. That's it's, it, there's not a lot of guys out there. I would say a small amount that can really do what you're doing. Uh, well, thanks so much for the time. It was a pleasure to meet you. Really fun to talk and also for the energy and helping to promote permission to fly, uh, which is cool. I'm very excited about it. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll get a chance to talk soon again. Yeah. And one more time, check out Floating Points. And what was that band again? Uh... Carbon Based Life Forms. Okay. Carbon Based Life Form. Okay. I'm on that right now. And awesome. Uh... I really Great. appreciate it, man. Thank you. And congrats on only being 67 instead of 68. <laughs> Thanks. For a little <laughs> while, until November when it all changes. There you go. I'll see you, buddy. All right, man. Take care. Bye-bye, yeah. Nadine.